So hello everyone and welcome to another episode of The Pulse where we talk to digital health influencers, entrepreneurs, enthusiasts, experts from all over the world. I can't wait to get this conversation started with our guest today. But just before that, a quick reminder to like and follow our LinkedIn page, subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're also on six different podcast channels, including Google Podcasts and Spotify. Um, I'm your host, Dr. Maida Fan, and today we have with us Alberto Malone, an MD hematologist, data scientist, and blockchain specialist. He is also a metaverse content creator and is currently working on a Web3 platform that facilitates privacy enabled health data management. Welcome to the podcast, Alberto. Well, uh, first of all, uh, I would say that I want to thank you so much, Maida, um, not just for inviting me and giving me this this opportunity to share my thoughts, but also for this great work you're you're performing with the Pills Podcast. I mean, I honestly think that um, this is a great endeavor uh, in terms of health literacy on uh, digital health literacy and and all of this work and, and sacrifice means a lot for for the community in, in the long term. So thank you very much again. Uh, you know, we're on the same ship here. So well, thank um, you so much, Alberto. It means a lot. I truly appreciate it. Thank you for your kind words. And I think that your intro alone was a mouthful. Um, I, it feels like I've used all the buzzwords in digital health already in the first 10 seconds of this episode. And we'll get on into all of that, I'm, I'm sure. But um, first, I'd just like to know a little bit about your background and how you went from, you know, being a hematologist, working in the lab, uh, to now working in the metaverse. Yeah, it's a, a great question and, and the most uh, usual question in this in these cases. Um, to start with, um, maybe I'd say I'm something like an engineer trapped inside a doctor's body. Um, I know it may say it may sound weird as a self description, but but I guess it's true in in my case. Um, I mean, I've always had this this passion about uh, technology, about digital health, and and I even started to show some some interest in data science and especially big data, like three, four years ago, but just as a hobby, you know, just in my free time. So um, later on, well, you know, eventually um, the it was a COVID pandemic that um, as it happened with many other people, um, somehow made me understood uh, there was something inherently wrong with the system. Um, and there was something uncomfortably wrong with myself or, or at least with my role in that system. Okay, so... Um, there was something I had previously dealt with as a as a resident doctor, uh, which was this huge amount of time you could waste just gathering data. Okay, and and I'm not just talking about informatic resources. Okay, even if if I'm just uh, 36 years old, um, I had to struggle and to carry these huge paper folders and, uh, you know, and make so many uh, trips to to carry them and to seek among all of these all of that huge amount of data in medical histories. So I thought, well, uh, you know, they always say that time is something very valuable. So there's there's something inherently wrong with, with this. Uh, I think that we can do better and we must do better. So um, as I said before, the, the pandemic arrived and, and well, I had to work hard on, on, on that battlefield with uh, along with all my, my colleagues. And it was hard and exhausting, but we all suddenly realized that despite all of the sources of information we, we have nowadays, um, when it comes to react quickly, uh, this has to be improved somehow. So there, there was this, this like a uh, click inside my head. I, I, I then started studying hard first data science. Uh, then I started with blockchain as well. And, and I guess that eventually um, I realized maybe I could somehow bring a little bit more value working on this rather than what I used to do. So yeah, just a couple of months ago, I, I decided to to jump to to bring, get take this step and, and start this, this adventure. Well, I think the pandemic really uh, gave a lot of people their light bulb moment and where they realized, you know, they could be doing so much more, um, you know, to help patients. And so uh, let's dive deeper into the metaverse, right? And I really want to pick your brain on that because there are a lot of areas in healthcare where the metaverse is already being explored. So for example, not only for direct patient care, but in medical education, clinical simulations, and then you have AR, VR assisted surgeries. And it's really amazing um, to see the potential of the metaverse really being used 
um, today. And it really, I think it makes room for more accessibility and flexibility when it comes to complex clinical situations. And so based on your first hand, since you're already working in the metaverse, I wanted to know from you what are some other applicable use cases that can truly impact patients' lives through the metaverse? Yeah. Of course, of course, absolutely. I mean, these use cases that you've mentioned are obviously priceless, but um, well, first of all, I, as I always do with my students and, and residents when I when I work in a hospital, I, I like to start always with, with definitions because so, sometimes uh, we already think that we're talking about the same thing, but um, somehow the this etymologic or semantic discussions are, are important. Um, I recently found a, a definition of, of the metaverse um, that I especially liked because it's more, um, you know, like something more global. Uh, it was something like, uh, it's the concept of an interconnected digital experience um, that complements and works in tandem with the physical world. Uh, it doesn't refer to any specific um, type of technology, rather it uses a blend of technologies to create a fully immersive experience. I think this is quite a quite a, um, a right approach or, or a right definition for for this concept. Uh, so this is just to say that it is not just about virtual reality, uh, but already existed before. In the end, um, it is not about distance, but it's about uh, building bridges to remove uh, those distance. Okay. So in relation to augmented reality, for example, one of the most um, known uh, you know technologies or or devices that we could use within the metaverse. Um, I would add some more uh, use cases or potential use cases because some of them are already being used, um, I mean, successfully, but some of them are not yet, or <laughs> at least as, as far as I know. Um, we're talking about education, for example, um, anatomy or physiology lessons. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we all will remember those, um, you know, those episodes of the famous TV shows, Dr. House, that we could see yeah. such a beautiful bunch of animations with blood vessels and immune system cells and, and so on. And, and that kind of uh, overlapping visual experiences could be could be priceless uh, somehow for, for students in, in several topics. We're talking about rehabilitation as well. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll know that every recovery process uh, is driven far better if you if you're home somehow or, or surrounded by your family or your beloved ones, or you find yourself in a, in a known place. Um, so why you shouldn't give this little help um, to your senses to overcome this pain or this weakness. Um, and then there's consultation or even the, the visit pass of, of admitted patients in, in hospital beds it could become a much more intuitive experience. I mean, uh, just imagine for a while these typically complicated elderly patients with so many conditions and a huge medical history, uh, no matter if we talk about acute or chronic disease, I mean, what if you could somehow visualize all of them, all of that medical history at a glance? I mean, just, I mean, literally seeing it. I mean, just by yeah. looking at the patients and, and seeing, for example, um, just uh, playing with imagination, um, the, um, seeing a liver disease or lung disease with color effects or a superposition mm -hmm. or, or overlapping with imaging tests. So in the moment you see the patient in bed or are your consultation, you quickly see which one's uh, the previous problem and you can focus on, on the on the solution or you can quickly access to to all of the um, all of the small details that you have to, to focus yeah. on. I mean, in the end, I hate to, yeah. or, or I used to hate to, to receive patients in a, in a consultation and just uh, keep working on a computer. I, I'm, and in the yeah. end, we, we're talking about an interaction, the, the, the relationship between patient and, and a physician and, and, and even yeah. with, uh, with nurses as well should be uh, direct, not with a screen. And, and it's, uh, it's like a paradox that we think that these kind of solutions may separate patients and, and, and professionals. And I think it's exactly the other way around. It's just something yeah. that may help you to directly interact with patients. So these are just few cases. I mean, possibilities are, are endless. I've recently read um, a paper about another use case that I hadn't heard about yet, which would be uh, an AR-based uh, solution for medication weight establishment. I mean, um, you know that the uh, medication dosage for each kind of uh, population, mm -hmm. for the elderly, for young people, for, yeah. um, depending on your weight and so many conditions um, are 
could be easily uh, customized or personalized just by seeing the patient. And if we can, we, if we could just adjust the the exact the the the, the correct dosage for for that kind of patient, uh, it could be a powerful tool. And and yeah. in fact, I mean, I I think that I've uh, I have here. Like the, the the results of the study were were uh, very interesting. I mean, like eighty percent were were correct identifying the the, the cutting position of the pills or or the or the drugs. So in the end, I think this is uh, um, a very powerful tool in in many in many ways, and and that's just about the augmented reality. I mean, I mean, not yeah. to mention virtual reality, which we use in one of the projects uh, I'm collaborating with, uh, which is called EB Health. Okay, it's basically mm-hmm. um, focused on on enabling this immersive framework uh, for patients. And I patients will, I will ask you more about that. Oh, I will okay. ask you. I'm just going to pause you for a second because I don't want to give everything away. Yeah, uh, of I course, will get of course. to your Sorry. project. <laughs> No, 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 that's fine. I will, I will uh, definitely ask you about the project, but you did mention some very pertinent points here in which you were referring to treatment, treating the terminally ill and how this is like a paradox and the human touch and the human interaction. And so while all with all these great advancements in the metaverse and in healthcare, there are, you have your share of skeptics and you have your share of critics. Right. Mm-hmm. And so there are a lot of people that say uh, that question, you know, the use of gamification or video games in in treating or uh, pain management, for example, in terminally ill patients. Or there are other people who point out, you know, grassroot level concerns saying that, you know, how does the metaverse, how does this virtual universe solve uh, problems like health inequities and mass access to care? And so and community health, for example. So, you know, I really want your opinion on that or your take on that is that. Uh, there's a lot of buzz going around that metaverse is a game changer for healthcare, but is it the answer to all our problems? Mm-hmm. Well, it might not be the answer to to all of our problems, as you already know, because I think that mm, nothing yet is is the answer to all of our problems. But the, the I would make the question the other way around. So, um, has it mm, so many? problems that and it seems I mean in the end all of these uh, kind of um, criticism or or skepticals um, have to do the same exercise that we do to to understand what kind of problems do we already have not not the the, the um, theoretical problems that we could have with um, this kind of technology but problems that we already have and how do things work nowadays with that um in terms of of uh, you know games to improve uh, patient outcomes for example for example and or gamification in general it's not like a theory it's like a fact i mean uh, in the end this this kind of approach of uh, sort of gamification of um, routinary tasks um, it really works I mean in the end it's like an incentive for people not we're, I'm not just talking about patients but any kind of industry and I mean in the end uh, we are human beings we have emotions and and if we have some uh, as they say some skin in the game uh, we have this additional incentive even if it's like um, something like a game but it's not necessary that way. I mean, we can do this. Uh, we can make this approach, or or we can obviously um, don't use uh, this kind of approach at all. This, this gamification at all. Um, in terms of lack of human touch, um, well, I I, I, it's, I I would say it's more like the opposite, as I said before. I mean, um, this something that it that pretends to build bridges, not not to not to enable distance. So in the end, um, uh, well, I mean, I've I've mentioned it before. Uh, it's something yeah. that that precisely helps us in that in that task it's not a problem but a solution in this sense um in relation to hardware or technical problems i mean obviously um i mean as, as i said before with the uh, initial definition of the concept of of the metaverse itself uh it does not depend on a particular technology obviously uh the more devices that you have or the more uh you know technologic solutions that you have will eventually help you to to improve this experience but it's not necessary. I mean, uh, you don't need this. Uh, I mean, when, when we talk about metaverse, we usually think about this kind of, of devices, but you don't need nothing uh, related to that. You don't need this device or, or any other smaller for augmented reality. You could use, I mean, you could not use, but, um, uh, you know, play a role in the metaverse with no type of device, with 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 no device at all. I mean, I'm not glad even... that it's a very important point actually, because that's what people say. Yeah. That, you know, you need the hardware, you need the software, and then it's about logistics, about providing this hardware to the patients to actually be able to use it and get, gain benefit from it. So it's a very good point, Alberto. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I appreciate that you mentioned. Yeah, go ahead, please continue. Uh, 
uh, yeah, no, no. I mean, I mean, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, in the end, you don't need not, not even a screen. I mean, as they say, uh, the the stuff is happening, um, no matter if you you can see it or not. Uh, the fact that you can see it or that you can feel uh, like immersed on it will improve your experience, but it will happen anyway. That, that's yeah. something like the, the concept of the data metaverse that we, we may eventually t- talk about it later on. So yeah. in the end, um, it happens today with, with uh, selective sectors. I mean, of course, uh, of course, uh, it could be like uh, quite a little bit selective in some terms, like the rest of technologies. I mean, in the end, this is a solution, a tool. So we just have to be aware of these technologies and integrate them. So those use cases mm-hmm. uh, will eventually come up as we can solve real problems with, with them, mm-hmm. not, not the opposite, not try to find use cases so we can justify its use or, or, or try to apply it everywhere, but just to yeah. uh, be aware of it. So this is my like my, my, my point of view. I, all, all of the previously mm-hmm. mentioned stories will help us to spread awareness about, about it among professionals and, and patients. No, I think that's great and such a good segue into my next question that is about data because I think you mentioned in the in the beginning that you you had all this patient data, you were carrying it around and you wanted to do something useful with it. And so we all know that healthcare differs from other industries because it's based on a unique framework, you know, that's centered around ethics and safety and patient privacy. And that's really where data comes in. And I know that you're working on a platform or a project that enables a secure health data management. And so please tell me a little bit more about that and what you're doing, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I guess this is uh, um, the million dollar question. Okay, so, well, you know, data science, as you know, try to bring solutions to some previously uh, unsolved problems uh, regarding management of huge amounts of, of data, what it happens with, with healthcare uh, data. But not just that. I mean, uh, it gives us some tools to effectively use this, this data to understand it and, and, and even to build predictive models um, that, and that allows us to predict uh, outcomes, which is obviously very interesting in, in healthcare. So here again, we deal with privacy and security concerns that are not always guaranteed with current technologies. So here's where blockchain come into the picture. Um, well, as I, as I did before, I, I, I like to start with, with definitions. So first of all, I'd rather talk about uh, DLTs, which uh, stands for Distributed Ledger Technologies, rather than just blockchain, because uh, well, as, as, you, as you already know, um, there are some other distributed ledger technologies, such as DAG, which, is an, which stands for Direct Acyclic Graph. And, you know, just to summarize briefly, that blockchain is like a um, chain of blocks, as its name says, with um, a lot of transactions that get validated into these blocks by all of the community, no matter if you do it with a computation effort, like the what, what's called proof of work, or with the participation of Foley Network, which would be the, the proof of stake. Um, instead, with DAG, um, what we have is not a, a, a singular chain, but uh, something more similar to a tree, which in which uh, each trans- tran- each transaction validates the rest of the transaction, and here's where the where the strength of the of the system relies. Of course, um, uh, each one of these technologies has its strengths and and its weaknesses, but in the end, uh, both DLTs somehow um, enable similar applications, and and both uh, would be considered as part of this so-called Web three paradigm or or environment, and this is very important. I mean, uh, the question: Can metaverse exist? without blockchain? Well, obviously, uh, um, the answer is yes. I mean, as I said before, there are other DLTs that uh, enable this Web3 ownership internet. But if we say, can Metaverse exist without Web3? I'd rather say, yes, it can, but it shouldn't, at least in my opinion. I mean, you know, immersive experiences and and, and virtual reality already existed 20 and 30 years ago. That's not new. Mm -hmm. That's not something that's that's new. Uh, The new big thing here is to make this interoperable, composable, uh, decentralized, and not just interactive, but also empowering. That would be the word. Okay, so in these terms, um, uh, here's where where, where we are more or less building, okay, the the, the project that I'm more um, committed to to it. So basically, um, uh, what we are building is a blockchain-based healthcare data management solution to allow patients be the real owners of, of their data, okay? So they can have 24-7 24-7 hours access to uh, their medical data uh, in a 100% confidential and constantly updated uh, way through the use of um, the so-called, <clears throat> sorry, dynamic NFTs, okay? We were all very aware about this word, the NFTs uh, word. And yeah. 
you know, um, most people think that it's something just related to collectibles or or art or, yeah. or data, and there's nothing wrong about that. But this is like just just the spike of of, of all the, the bunch of, of possible use cases that that is have. It's like eventually to to prove um, digital ownership. Just to summarize, it's not maybe it's not the the, the most correct definition, but it's what enables. And to um, as I said before, um, we could we, we would use these so-called dynamic NFTs. To eventually even monetize this value they generate, okay. Um, not just talking about net income, but um, for example, um, you know, extra medical services or assessment, or even donations to scientific research or any other cause they they want to support. I mean, um, even even we can set some uh, customized health targets so they can even go further with with monetization and um, and in case of achieving these these targets. So in the in the end, this is uh, what we call empowering patients. Okay, basically what we offer is 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 is, is this. We can deploy this by um, basically combining two different blockchain technologies. One of them uh, would be what we call an oracle. It's in, in essentially something that feed the blockchain with with off-chain real-world data, validating it on a, on a decentralized um, and secure manner. And mm -hmm. um, the other one is a like, confidential secure enclave that allows us to tokenize data. So it's um, it's the owner, the, the, the patient, uh, who decide whether he or she wants to share it or not. But again, the most important thing, apart from security and confidentiality, is to empower him, to give to give him or her the possibility to, um, to be the, the right owner of this information to get access to it and to eventually monetize it because it's it's the value they're generating all of this is about building awareness of the value they they generate however well um we're still in a very early and, and initial stage and but we're starting to make in some some significant advances already and and the other project i i was talking about before the of uh, eb health is, is like more something more focused on just the virtual reality uh environment for not just uh, education, but also for telehealth and and, and teleconsultation and, and things like that. So this would be. Uh, um, however, um, I'm I'm just like um, an, an advisor to this uh, okay. project, and and I'm like the the original mind behind mm -hmm. uh, the first one. So we're in, on that. Well, amazing, point. amazing, and thank you. And I just love the way you're driving this conversation. You're you're literally doing my job for me. This is such an effortless <laughs> podcast. I Sorry. appreciate no, it. No, I made it. It's my fault. I start talking and, I, and I, I'm easily No, I stop. appreciate I mean, you know, I appreciate it. And I just, because uh, you're, it's, we're building up and I think you're just, you're automatically just driving me towards my, effortlessly driving me towards my next question. And um, so I know I don't want, we're almost uh, at time. And I, I really want to ask you a little bit about uh, patient awareness. Um, you know, I talk a lot about awareness. I know you believe about, uh, you believe in patient awareness and what, uh, especially concerning the rights that they have to their own medical data and to their health data. And so just touch very briefly about the fundamentals of patient rights to their data and something that they should know about. And I, I believe most patients don't. Hmm. Well, um, I mean, as I said before, it's it's basically um, a human right. I mean, um, the thing is that um, reality, uh, at least in my opinion, or, or well, at least we can we can check out uh, data easily. Um, reality is quite a bit far from theory nowadays, and this is what we try to solve or, or at least to improve. Okay. Um, there are a lot of, of situations in which, um, you know, not just patients but users in general are not aware of a problem. I mean, in the end, we are here to solve problems, but uh, there are a lot of, in many situations, we are not aware uh, of these problems, okay? Um, here's the fact that we're when we work as, as physicians or as, as nurses or any other kind of healthcare professional, we can see things from, from behind the curtain, if you allow me this expression, and, and we can understand how things are done in the kitchen. So um, we realize that there are a lot of things that, they, they should have uh, access to, for example, I mean, we always say that um, this medical data belongs to the patients. I mean, it, this is um, more or less worldwide. I mean, maybe there's some countries that, that not, not that way, but basically it's, it's, something that, it's something that I could call a human right. But um, when, when we take this to reality, we realize that, okay, if I'm a patient, for example, I want to get access to my last, my latest, um, you know, um, informs or my latest uh, medical records, or perhaps some uh, analytics that I've, um, I was made like two years ago, 
and it's not easy not easy i mean uh, even if we are talking about private institution it's it's not extremely easy at least um in most of cases so in the end um uh, i mean you have to start a, a bureaucratic process to claim this information to get the the latest version of it um there there's a lot of time that that have you know that happens between you um, make this um, this claim, and you get information. So it's like a bunch of, of problems in, in the end. And 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 well, uh, you know, we live, nowadays we live in this uh, uh, global world with. Um, the, I, I, I don't want to to talk about any specific uh, organization, but I think that we are all aware about uh, these big companies that that make business with with data. I mean, I think that there's nothing inherently wrong with that, but there's some ingredient of unfairness if you realize that we are the protagonists of this story and we are not getting any value uh, in return so this is like the 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 topic that we wanted to to focus on i mean not just the usual thing about the right to get access to your data but also the right to get some um, somehow and I, I'm not just talking about just economic rewards, as I said before, yeah, yeah. we can talk about value in, in many ways, or even in, about, um, you know, um, bringing that value to another cause to uh, research. So it's, your point that, it's your point that you mentioned about incentivizing healthcare. I think yeah, that's so important. That's the word. That's the word. word. And I think, I think that's so important. And just, just before we wrap up, uh, Alberto, where do you see healthcare in 10 years? Sorry, I didn't get. Where where do you see healthcare in ten years? Ah, okay. Um. Well, um. I I don't know. I mean, obviously, that's a that's a hard question. I mean, uh, maybe our our main uh, challenges here with these uh, highly promising technologies are um, regulation, compliance, and and this kind of of issues. I mean, it's normal. I mean, we, uh, it's something I understand. We're talking about sensitive topics, and we're talking about human rights after all. But again, it's just a matter of time. Um, when the authorities start to see the nature and the underlying mechanism of these uh, technologies, um, as well as their successful use cases that are already being deployed, um, I think regulation and, and standardization will uh, will naturally start to, to flow, in my opinion. So this this will be the, the main challenges that we have to, to focus in, in this direction and to be sure of uh, humanizing these these technologies. I don't know if if, uh, if you will, so would like to some yeah. some conclusions uh, already or, or maybe yeah, later please, on. Yeah, a key takeaway, a message. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. So to summarize, I would say about um, I mean, to highlight some key uh, take home messages. I would talk about awareness, education. I mean, this is just beginning. Just that uh, the potential is there, um, and the best possible speaker is to see uh, these working in real world, solving real problems. The second one would be prevention over treatment. Okay, this is one thing that we particularly um, aim at our, at our project uh, to sell these incentives for improving healthcare, not just to receive the service, but to try to improve your health so we can improve overall health. Um, and yet we, we should humanize technology, um, no matter if we were talking about AI, metaverse, blockchain, I mean, or, or at least let, let these technologies to show up their human side. I, I've, I've already seen it. I mean, I've been to yeah. uh, several conferences, work groups, leave events. Of course, there are a lot of things to improve, but you can easily uh, realize it's something different. Okay, this something. This this should be something built by communities for communities, and and hopefully uh, we're gonna make it. And at least, but but the last, I say to unleash the the power of this of this data. Okay, uh, to realize the the high value we all generate and its potential for all the worldwide society. Um, if well understood. Um, this can be definitely game changing and, and this could accelerate or boost my biomedical research in decades. So we are just at the beginning of this road. Well, amazing. I I really had uh, fun. This is not my area of expertise. I'm just sitting as a student in this podcast, to be honest. And I appreciate Absolutely. it. I really do. Um, thank you so much for your time, Alberto. And uh, thank you for sharing these valuable insights. Thank you so much. On the contrary, as I said before, you're performing a great work with with this uh, with this project, and and I'm I'm absolutely glad to to contribute to it. So so thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it for everyone listening. Take care of yourselves. Until next time. Bye bye.